To most people, the long sunny days of summer are a time for rest and relaxation. The birds sing out each morning and the air is filled with the symphony of nature's sounds. Flowers provide a ready source of food for insects and their numbers grow quickly. They are held in check by the numerous insect-eating birds, collecting prey for themselves or for their carefully hidden young. During summer, many birds are totally dependent on this insect harvest. Without it, they would almost certainly starve to death. Insects are a fine source of protein. Even quite large birds find them attractive, like this little owl. Though we're used to thinking of owls as rodent killers, during summer, most of the little owl's food is composed of insects. But autumn is closing in, and this wealth of insect food won't last forever. The wood ants respond by working flat out to collect enough food to see them through the winter. After they've harvested the fruits of summer, they can survive even the severest weather, safe in their underground nests. The question is, how are the birds going to cope? Autumn is a time of slowing down, of letting go, a time of dying, symbolised by the falling leaves and the golden brown wash that enriches every woodland scene. The pulse along the web of life lessens, and all creatures begin running down their activities in preparation for the coming winter. By the end of summer, birds and mammals have both completed the important job of raising their young. Most families have dispersed, and every creature is faced with the difficult task of surviving the coming winter alone. Different species have found different answers to this problem, but an absolutely vital factor in their response is the food they choose to eat. Eating is important, because birds and mammals are warm-blooded. Unless they can hibernate, they have to maintain a high body temperature, no matter what the temperature is outside. When it's cold, they lose far more heat, so they must feed more to make up for this extra loss. Many cash in on the vast supplies of autumn fruits and berries, rooting through leaves and soil as supplies become scarcer. For birds like the wood pigeon, the problem is to find enough grain and seed to keep alive. That task is hard enough, but birds that eat insects are much worse off. Unlike birds, insects are cold-blooded. Their body temperature depends on just how hot or cold it is. When it's cold, they can hardly move a muscle. So as autumn slips into winter, the insects must seek shelter or freeze to death. Most hide away in secluded nooks and crannies. Some, like this butterfly, hibernate in the eaves of roofs, while others overwinter as grubs deep in the heart of a tree. Others survive as eggs. The vaporer moth sticks its eggs to the bark of an oak tree, relying on camouflage to protect its young. The caterpillar of the green-veined white has another strategy. It chooses a suitable plant stem and then fastens itself in place with a girdle of silk from its spinnerets. After a final molt, the chrysalis gradually settles down and begins its long wait for spring. Its outer skin becomes hard and brown, making it look for all the world like an autumn leaf, perfect camouflage for the coming winter. The disappearance of so many of their prey forces many bird species to take drastic steps. House martins leave the country for warmer climes where the insect pickings are better. Sand martins too take off for sunnier shores, 
leaving lonely tunnel entrances where, just a few weeks earlier, groups of hungry young clamoured to be fed. All are now thousands of miles away. Winter has arrived. Despite the dearth of insects in the wood, it's possible for a number of summer insect-eating birds to remain in the British Isles. A few even continue to feed as if it was still summer. The tree creeper has evolved an insect feeding technique which stands it in good stead all through the year. The overgrown feet fix the bird firmly to the trunk while the delicately down-curved bill is ideal for probing the sheltered recesses of the bark, hauling out dormant insects. The tree creeper's tail feathers are also adapted to its mountaineering existence. They are specially strengthened and can be pressed against the tree to help support the bird as it moves upwards on its trunk spiralling journey. The triple combination of searching beak, large claws and rigid tail feathers enables the tree creeper to find its food whatever the season. Only in particularly hard winters, when the bark is glazed with ice, does it find itself in trouble. Most times, though, its unusual lifestyle allows the tree creeper to survive well in the now barren woodland. In the marshes and heathland of southern England, there's another master of the difficult art of overwintering. Living deep among the dense stands of gorse, the Dartford warbler pioneers in existence at the northern limit of its range in Europe. Severe winter weather is especially hard on this species. In the early 1950s, there were 450 breeding pairs in the United Kingdom. Two successive bad winters reduced that figure to just 10 pairs. Despite this, the Dartford warbler is one of the few warblers to overwinter in these islands. Why should most of these birds stay behind to brave an English winter when they could so easily be over the channel, winging their way to warmer, greener pastures? The reason seems to be that in its chosen habitat, the Dartford warbler can still find enough spiders and insects to eat throughout the year. Not all insects are so easily found. For some aquatic insects, the icy depths of a winter stream must seem just the spot to avoid all but the hardiest predator. But even here, one bird pursues them. The dipper. All through the year, aquatic insects form 90% of its food. Some of the dipper's food is taken by foraging under stones at the waterside. Other birds can use the same technique. This grey wagtail, just molting into breeding plumage, can also paddle in the shallows, seeking food. But it must keep its feathers dry. The dipper has no such problem. The thick, fluffy plumage traps a layer of insulating air over its body, preventing the bird freezing to death in the cold mountain streams. While the wagtail must be content with the meagre pickings above water, the dipper harvests a plentiful supply of underwater insects. Flying from stone to stone on its short, stubby wings, even when the temperatures are so low that the insects become dormant, the dipper can still seek them out. Dippers aren't found where the rivers run deep and slow but there's still plenty of life in the woods. The owner of that harsh, trilling voice is a wren. At less than four inches from beak to tail, the wren seems too small to survive in really cold weather. And indeed, its tiny body cannot store heat for long. But because the wren is so small, it can probe the tiniest crevices for insect food exploiting a niche that other birds are too large to make use of. So its small size is actually its biggest asset.
In contrast to the delicate searchings of the wren, other woodland birds have evolved varying techniques to solve the problem of overwintering among the barren fields, woods and hedgerows. One has even resorted to brute force. It looks as if there's been a power drill at work here, and in a way there has. The culprit is a green woodpecker whose big heavy bill is the avian equivalent of a pneumatic drill, ideal for hammering a way through to the hidden supply of insect larvae. Although it's well adapted to tree life, the green woodpecker spends quite a lot of time feeding at ground level, and its strong bill comes in just as useful here. This bird has found a wood ant's nest and is systematically tearing it apart, eager to devour the startled inhabitants. The ants mill about at the surface of the nest, trying desperately to defend their home from the woodpecker's attack. But their stings have almost no effect. The woodpecker continues to feed, ruthlessly exploiting this lifeline to the kinder days of spring. Brute force, hard work and an enormously long tongue are the tools of the woodpecker's winter trade. It's not long before the ants' underground city is reduced to ruins, awaiting spring's warmth to allow them to rebuild. On even the mildest January morning, trees and plants are covered with a wintry lacework of ice. They sparkle with crystal pattern frosts. It may look pretty, but frost is the enemy of all insects. They retreat deeper into their hiding places, making the bird's task of finding them even harder. Some birds cope by changing their diet completely. In summer, the goldfinch feeds largely on insects and spiders, but in the short days of winter, it relies on a variety of plant foods. The fine pointed beak prizing out seeds and berries. By changing its diet in this way, the goldfinch can feed quite well, hardly noticing the lack of insects. While the goldfinch searches for food in the branches, the chaffinch, another winter resident, feeds almost exclusively on the ground. It has a much stronger, heavier beak, useful in opening the hard seeds on which it feeds. But creatures other than birds find fallen seeds attractive. Wood mice, for instance. Foraging for food in daylight is a recipe for disaster, especially when there are owls about. Like the goldfinch and the chaffinch, the little owl gives up insect eating during the winter. But instead of changing to a menu of seeds, the little owl looks for bigger game to satisfy its hunger. It's well equipped for such a lifestyle, with long, razor-sharp talons, a squat and heavy-set body, and a viciously hooked beak. Introduced into Britain from the continent during the 19th century, the little owl is now established over much of England and Wales, though still rare in Scotland. It often hunts by day, waiting silently and patiently for the slightest sound or movement in the grass below. Even the sharp ears of the mouse fail to hear the owl's approach. And no wonder. Owls have evolved a fine velvety pile over the surface of their wing feathers which deadens the noise of flight and allows them to hunt in almost total silence. Small mammals and a few birds make up the bulk of the little owl's diet during the winter. They're quite a substantial catch for a small bird. A single mouse is all the little owl needs for one day.
This change of diet from insects in summer to flesh in the colder months of the year allows the little owl to survive the twin blights of all overwintering birds, hunger and cold. Within minutes, nothing remains of the mouse. Even after the world tilts back towards summer and daylight gradually increases, the birds still have several weeks of hard living ahead. Members of the tit family scratch a living on the floor of the forest. They feed mainly on last year's crop of fallen beech mast, but the leaf litter holds a bonus too. Underneath the insulating blanket of decaying vegetation, the air is still warm and moist, ideal for insects and other invertebrates. The birds use these as a protein supplement to their basic seed diet. The tit's greatest asset is its ability to adapt. If the forest stops providing sufficient food, it's quite willing to move out into our own urban world, where humans make the problem of filling one's stomach far less difficult. As much at home on the top of a milk bottle as on the leafy branch of an oak tree, tits are the opportunists of the bird world, quickly finding a new source of food, like bottled milk, and exploiting it in the name of survival. Of course, if one really wants the cream for the cornflakes, an inverted tumbler will defeat even the cleverest tit. Unlike blue tits, some bird species seem incapable of altering their feeding behavior, even when the going gets tough. They're the prisoners of their genes, locked by shape and temperament into a single lifestyle. The bearded tit from a different family is one such specialist, living its whole life among the swaying stems of the reed bed. Many migrant warblers live here during the summer, but the bearded tit, almost alone, remains to eke out a winter existence. It feeds on the minute seeds in the reed heads. The supply usually lasts through to spring, but in really hard winters, there comes a day when the bare reed stems tell their own hungry tale. Unable to feed elsewhere, the bearded tits are starving. Only one or two survive, making their way forlornly through the tangled scrub, picking for seeds. If spring does not come soon, even these pitiful survivors will perish. But spring does arrive. Dawn comes more quickly to the night sky, the shadows shorten, and the air loses its cold, biting edge. The first snowdrops stir from their winter sleep and push their way into the light. Primroses brighten the woodland scene, welcoming the warming rays of the sun. Winter loosens its icy grip, and once again, Life flows strongly throughout the countryside. Soon the woodland is alive with colour, carpeted with new flowers. And flowers mean nectar, food for many insects. The queen wasp, sole survivor of last year's colony, emerges from her woody retreat. For the past five months, she's lain dormant, oblivious of the winter storms. But soon she'll lay her first batch of eggs. The workers will hatch, and a new wasp nest will be born. But for now she rests, cleaning her body and antennae of the wood and dust accumulated over her long winter sleep. Within its brown camouflage skin, the green-veined white caterpillar has transformed itself miraculously into a winged adult. Now it splits its protective coat and struggles to be free. This is the most dangerous time for any emerging butterfly. Its wings are crumpled and useless, making it easy pickings for any would-be predator. While the compound eyes search for danger, 
the veins of the wings are pumped with blood, stiffening and strengthening them, ready for flight. Only then is the insect equipped to take to the relative safety of the spring air. All over the wood, the insects are stirring. The adult tortoiseshell that crawled away in autumn now emerges from its long hibernation. It spreads its wings to catch the warmth of the sunshine. There's more to this than simple sunbathing. All butterflies, like this peacock, need to reach a certain body temperature before they can fly. Opening their wings helps them to warm up much faster. This first bloom of trees and insects hardly goes unnoticed by the birds. Blue tits don't find wings to their taste, but they enjoy the rest of the moth. Many of the newly awakened moths and butterflies are taken as soon as they emerge. Those that escape the hungry attentions of the birds seek out freshly budded leaves on which to lay their eggs. And these soon hatch out into leaf-destroying caterpillars, like this mottled umber, known, for obvious reasons, as a looper. The caterpillar is basically an eating machine. Its job is to convert leaf into insect as quickly as possible, storing sufficient protein and energy to power the change from caterpillar to butterfly. But such a high protein parcel makes the caterpillar irresistible to birds. Species like the chaffinch forsake seed-eating and devour the insects in their thousands. To counter this loss, millions of insect eggs are produced. Many insects have another function. While seeking pollen and nectar, they pollinate the flowers, ensuring a new supply of blossom for the following spring. If the birds don't get them first, Despite this heavy hunting pressure by the birds, the woods are alive with the sound of insects. Birds are not the only enemy an insect has to face. Spiders take a heavy toll, ensnaring them in their concealed webs. As the spring advances, more and more insects take to the air either to disperse or on mating flights. And as if on cue, those hard-flying migrants, the swifts and swallows, return to Britain, ready to take advantage of this aerial plankton. After a journey of up to 5,000 miles, the house martins once again take up residence under the eaves. Like the majority of birds, they find the insect supply invaluable for feeding their young. But summer doesn't last forever, and once the insect harvest is over, the young birds must be ready for winter. The strategies they'll use to keep alive are diverse, but each fits the needs of a particular species, allowing the birds to survive the greatest test they're ever likely to face, the cold, bleak months that come after the harvest.